Hello everyone, uh, good evening, this is Dr. Khan. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring my guest on, so please bear with me. It's a pleasure to be here with one of my patients, and it's been a while since I have done a Facebook Live. If you please uh, give me a, a minute or so, I'm gonna go ahead and bring my guest on. Good evening to everyone. Please bear with me as I connect with my uh patient. Okay, um, please give me a minute. I see uh, uh, my, uh, my guest is coming on. Um, so there we go. Can you, uh, hi, good to see you. I see, yes, very nice, very good. All right, wonderful. Um, so uh, I uh, am very happy that I'm able to connect with you. Uh, and um, it's a pleasure to have you on. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and to go into a lot of details. Uh, and um, uh, having said so, I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce myself, and then I'll have you introduce yourself. Um, so I am Dr. Shahar Khan. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon. I'm board-certified by the American Board of Surgery for General Surgery. Um, and then also Bur for Burns Critical Care, uh, that was a fellowship that I did, and then three years of plastic surgery training uh, that was uh, basically a board certification uh, by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, the one and only true board that authenticates and certifies plastic surgeons. Um, so my specialty now is strictly devoted to explantation. I remove both saline and silicon uh, uh, Implants. I also remove uh, what are residual capsules, um, and my specialty um, is dedicated strictly to uh, explant uh, uh, surgery. For a doctor, uh, for a surgeon who who did not augment, um, I chose not to augment. I've only augmented once as a board certified plastic surgeon. I choose to not to do, do a procedure that only ultimately hurts the patients, and I'm only happy and humble to hear look at the movement where the FDA and the manufacturers and the patients are taking, most importantly, where the patients are taking so that we learn this disease better and that we recognize it uh, in a very uh, significant way, in a way that any disease needs to be recognized and that the many patients, millions of which who have implants, get the treatment and the relief that they very much need. Having said so, uh, can you please uh, introduce yourself? Hi, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Shannon and I am uh, a recipient of a breast implant and I'm from Ontario, Canada. Sure. Now, you know, one thing I want to mention, we talked about this very briefly and the question we, uh, we had was, you know, should we prepare? So I have never prepared for any of my Facebook lives. These are direct extempore on the spot. Shannon doesn't know what questions we're gonna ask or where we're gonna go with this. Uh, it was literally, uh, Shannon, do you wanna go on and explain your story? And I said, you have a wonderful and a very, uh, very, uh, what's the word to use? Significance, uh, you know, you're, you've gone through so many 
uh, hurdles in order to have come to me. So having said so, why did you get your breast implants, uh, uh, Shen? Huh. Well, um, I got my implant, I got one implant, and I got it, um, I decided about three years after I had cancer in 2007. In about 2010, I decided to get an implant um, because I had been using these pillow things to put in my bra and uh, I didn't have a prosthesis and I thought these things are really cumbersome and I wanted to have something more permanent. And I remember being in a grocery store with my kids and I remember just having them help me put things in the cart and I have a very um, a son that's very vocal and speaks speaks up and he noticed that <laughs> my pillows fell out onto the floor in the grocery store and I thought and he says mommy I said your breast just fell on the floor and I said what and he said you just lost your breast and everybody in the grocery store looked down at at what happened and I just quickly didn't miss a beat I scooped them up put them in my purse and I thought right that's that's the end of that I'm going to get an implant now because I don't want to have to deal with the embarrassment of losing these things so that's no and again you know these are the small things in life that one incident uh, basically led you now you had a mastectomy correct I did yes yes I had a um, and then a mastectomy because the cancer crossed the margin. So I had to have the mastectomy then. Right. You have a lumpectomy and then a mastectomy. Um, and so basically, and this was just the right side, correct? Yes. So you ended up getting a mastectomy and then you ended up a couple years later, ended up getting implant-based reconstruction. Yes, I did. So you lived uh, with that implant uh, for many years and in 2020, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you did explant, correct? You did remove the implant. Yes, I did an explant with a local surgeon, um, and I made it quite um, known that it needed to be removed 100%, and she was on board with that and said that it would be done 100%. Um, uh, what, what was going to be done 100%? Um, they were going to remove the implant. She was going to remove the implant first um, before I... I had her commit to that. She tried to talk me out of removing my implant and um, they sent me for an MRI scan. And um, with that MRI, it came back that everything was still intact. I didn't need to worry that it would be, um, uh, you know, affecting me in the way that it had been had so many symptoms and they said no you're what, fine. what were the symptoms so what were the symptoms you were going through when you had your implant i had 30 plus symptoms they were all my body was falling apart i um i went for from 2010 when i had it put in my nose started to run and i didn't know what was going on that's the first symptom and it did this for years and i went to an allergy specialist no allergies um i uh you know i just didn't know what was going on and so then i started to my hair started to fall out my um eyes started to close i couldn't couldn't see well my my uh, whites of my eyes were yellow I had rashes all over my body, um, itchiness. Uh, my hands and feet were swollen, sore, red, throbbing, burning. And I went to many specialists for, I, I saw so many specialists just to find out what's going on because I felt I was dying, <laughs> really. And all, all those specialists basically said you, uh, you're in good health otherwise, correct? Well, one of the specialists, it was during COVID, I had to be on a phone to talk to him. And so um, he was a, uh, a specialist at the hospital. And he told me that I was a candidate for COPD. And I, they did blood work on me. And I went to my doctor and my doctor said, that's impossible. You don't smoke, you don't have the lifestyle, you, you hardly drink and um that's just not your lifestyle and i and i would to have a blood test i was supposed to have one in six more months so they tested me and very all the levels met copd and then six months later they were all normal and so then i spoke with another internal medicine specialist and he said that i i had a probably had a bone marrow disorder 
And I said, well, that's, I don't feel like this is going that direction. And he said, um, we're going to give you a blood test in about six months again. And I said, well, do you mean like bone marrow disorder, like leukemia? And he said, yes. And I said, wow, you know, if, if that's the case, I don't want to wait for six months with a possibility of having leukemia. So I persisted. I said, I want it earlier. So they did it earlier. It came back. I, my doctor read the results said, you do not have leukemia. He said, everything's normal. I don't know where they're coming up with this stuff, but first it's escalated and then it becomes normal. And I, I most oral neuropathy, my hands and feet, um, erythromyalgia in my feet. And um, it just, all the specialists, a lot of them, they, they just didn't know they were bring it back to the implant and I would say well could it be my implant no no we don't think so you know wow wow so. so this is significant one of the doctors is telling you you have COPD type symptoms and remember COPD is very common chronic obstructive pulmonary disease these are in chronic smokers obstruction of the airway where you have a lot of resistance you initially had it and then basically resolved or at least that doctor felt that you had it then leukemia the one doctor said that you, and I remember these are very like uh, diagnoses uh, that need to be made with good certainty because the treatment itself is pretty strong, right? Chemotherapy amongst, uh, you know, inhalers among others. And so one of these other doctors is telling you you have leukemia and then your symptoms quote, improve and you have on workup subsequently showing that you have no leukemia. And then obviously you've mentioned peripheral neuropathy for those patients. That means that pins and needles type of feeling, decreased sensation at the tips of the fingers and toes, where you feel like you have like a pinched nerve type of a sensation at the toes and, and the fingers, like carpal tunnel type symptoms. And so, so you were you had almost 30 of those 55 symptoms. Now, this is where I say to the many patients, look, where all the tests keep coming back negative. And the good news is you went to your doctors, you got tested, you had no MS, no rheumatoid arthritis, you had no leukemia, no lymphoma. It's always good to get that checked because anyone uh, potentially can get it, right? Yeah. And yeah. so you, you go through the battery of tests and they rule that out. Now, when you have, now, if you could please remind us, how old are you? Um, let me think, I'm 57. Yes. So what, you know, and we have to take age into perspective. So when someone's 57, nowadays 57 means nothing. You know, you're at the, if you look at a surgeon at their, the peak of their career, you know, you're not even a CEO of a company. It's not uncommon to have 67, 77 year olds running and managing companies and having full lifestyles. A friend of mine is a plastic surgeon. He's operating uh, at 77. So going back to, you know, and this is when you were in your early 50s, perimenopausal, this is when these symptoms are going on. So here you have all these labs that are, quote, coming back within normal limits, and you have what persists to be these 30 or so of these uh, breast implant illness symptoms. And this is where I say when more and more of those labs are negative, there are more and more fingers pointing towards what is breast implant illness till proven otherwise. Now, remember what is interesting in your story, these are your words, that your symptoms kind of came very early on. You had that runny nose, you said, right? Uh, and remember the dryness of the throat, uh, the ENT type symptoms, tinnitus ringing in the ears, vertigo, the head spinning. Again, these are, not everyone has it, but these are where you have to go get checked, make sure that you don't have what is the obvious, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, so you, you decided that at what did, now you're, what's very interesting, again, your own words, your plastic surgeon said you do not have to remove your implants and she got an MRI that was normal. At what time did you know that, no, I am going to remove them? Well, I went home, she kind of talked me out of it and then I'm very persistent and um, with healthcare and I'm very polite about it, but I, I just made it known to them that I wanted to have this removed anyhow, even though it looks like it's intact on the MRI, I know that the membrane, um, the silicone and whatever else can leak through the membrane and, and migrate to the different organs. And I said, I, and this is a textured implant and it was also on recall by Allergan. And so um, I received a letter saying that, you know, watch, watch this. And 
I just felt it needed to be out of my chest. I, I was feeling like I was dying and I felt that this was the reason why. So, <laughs> so no, what's interesting is you took this, you're a very assertive, strong willed person. And I admire that. That's how everyone should be. You know, here you overrode what your plastic surgeon and you knew better in your heart that you were making the right decision. And, you know, I admire that quality and this is a good quality to have where very nicely and very professionally, you basically were in disagreement with your plastic surgeon. Now, this is a lot of strong will on your end because this is not easy. Many of the ladies, and I'll tell you, sometimes when I listen to someone, I blindly follow what they have to say. Now, you took the initiative in your own hand, the medical decision-making. Now, what did you know at, in 2020 that you needed to do? You needed to remove the implant and what else? Like, what did you know? What was the goal of your surgery? The goal of my surgery was to remove the implant and everything surrounding it. And um, she said she might not be able to do it because uh, the, she would have to cut so close to the rib and she could puncture my lung. And she said all these things that could possibly happen. And I thought, I don't care if you puncture my lung, you puncture my lung. I just want this out. So she, she, my goal was to get everything removed and, um, feel better that was my big goal to feel better i wanted the symptoms to lift um because i was uh i was not coherent i couldn't communicate with my family my head was so foggy and i was just a basket case and that and especially during COVID, i i thought my surgery was in march and then i was ready to go and then they canceled it because of COVID and put it to june and i thought i can't wait this long it was so I was so desperate to have it out. And because how, how certain were you that these were the implants? How certain I, I was, I was very certain because I had rashes um, on my shoulder, arm, chest, bright red. Um, my implant was hard. Um, I was itchy. My head had like, I, I just, I knew it was the implant. It was in, like, I have gut feelings about things and I, I had been to every specialist and nobody was giving me answers and I was diagnosing myself. And I knew that um, I had to find a proper explant surgeon to do it. And I thought I had one. <laughs> right, but right. Now, what's interesting is, so you actually had a full discussion with your plastic surgeon and she basically told you that she was going to remove the whole capsule, uh, even though it was a risky operation, correct? This is the same plastic surgeon who told you, uh, don't remove them, correct? Yeah, she said, she said, this could be something else. She doesn't really think it's breast implant illness. And I thought, well, um, of course, they're going to say that and kind of dissuade you from getting it done because if it was the implant it would they'd go out of business you know because people wouldn't be getting them so right, I, right. Uh, I, no, no yeah now what's interesting is i'll tell you this if you went to 100 plastic surgeons let's say you got in a jet and you said you know what i'm going to go to the top 100 plastic surgeons in the us or in canada or in europe all of them would they say you all these are 10 years in Let's go ahead and get another set and we'll replace them, right? Now, unfortunately, that even today uh, in April of 2023, that still continues to be the answer very sadly because of, look, what the manufacturers have, are themselves writing about the implants and what the FDA has brought to the attention of the patients and most importantly, the recognition of breast implant illness in itself to be a real entity with a lot of problems, with a lot of uh, misery, right? So despite this look, even today, uh, if someone gets breast cancer, guess what? The treatment of choice, the standard of care, unfortunately, is to get implants. 90% of the patients, unfortunately, still to this day get implants. The other 10% choose to because they might be just way too sick. Look, I will tell you, my neighbor, she had a kidney transplant. She is not a candidate. Candidate. If you look at the manufacturers themselves, she should not have gotten a breast implant. Guess what? A board-certified plastic surgeon and a kidney transplant patient. My neighbor, I talked to her. She ended up getting uh, breast implants. I had a lady uh, with um, cystic fibrosis. This is lung problem, right? These are ladies that get infection. And, you know, certainly the longevity is much improved than what it was uh, a couple of decades, three decades ago. 
this one lady came to me a board certified plastic surgeon history of cystic fibrosis put in implants in her i have to say that is malpractice for both of these patients remember this is not uh to be uh played around with you know these are patients lives with a lot of problems just the other day on monday i saw a patient she had radiation to her chest and despite the radiation uh, two years later, very similar to your story, she ended up getting reconstruction with implants. Remember, the complication rate goes up significantly high because the radiation makes the chest very leathery, hard. The nerves get burnt along with the skin that does not retain the sensitivities, the nerve endings, and the qualities of a good skin, which are the oil that the skin produces. All of that is shot with the radiation, so it becomes leathery hard. And at least a 30 to 50 percent complication in those patients who have had a radiated chest if they do get implants and remember there are many patients who get a, a tissue expander and the next thing you know the lymph nodes come back positive and the next thing you know the patient is getting radiation on a chest that already has a tissue expander which is a bad idea uh, and sometimes I I see the patients ended up getting an infection, for example, and the next thing you know, radiation or chemotherapy is on hold because the patient has an open wound chest. Now the cosmetics or the aesthetics basically are more important than treatment of that cancer because the patient has lymph nodes positive. Now going back to you, so you had a discussion, you knew that you wanted those capsules out and you talked to your plastic surgeon. She is the one who basically downplayed breast implant illness. So that in itself, and I'll tell you this, these, this is the take home message. If you're a breast implant uh, uh, a removal doctor, the explant plastic surgeon does not believe in breast implant unless, please turn away and politely say thank you so much. We appreciate your time because you don't want to be in your situation because that is what happened unfortunately next. Now, please go ahead and tell me, how did you find me? I did a lot of research about what was happening to me and I. I just researched breast implant illness and I found you online and I heard your, um, you speak and the testimonials of the patients that you have. And I thought, right, this is the person I'm going to see. And I was encouraged maybe to go out west, you know, to British Columbia. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to get airfare tickets out west. It's an easier drive to Michigan. Yes, it's over the border. It's in the States. We don't have health coverage. But um, I started a GoFundMe page and I had a lot of support and it helped to uh, push me forward to, to see you. No, 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 this is what you said is huge. So a lot of ladies, you know, I, I, I'm going to talk, um, I'm going to discuss three, four points. You know, I will tell you whatever it takes, uh, you know, for you to do your homework. What you said is key. Listen to the patients. Because the patients know what's going on. They're smart. You can be a physicist. You can be a librarian. You can be a stay-at-home mom. Or you can be a nurse practitioner or a doctor. I will tell you, you can be a any person. Uh, you know, you could be working at a restaurant business owner or a hair salon, a, you know, owner. Uh, and these are patients from all walks of life. They have in them the insight the ability to comprehend you don't have to be a medical doctor to comprehend this you know you had that ability to reason to understand what was the goal of the surgery and to basically seek that out and the most important thing is here you listen to the surgeon directly what he's saying and number two you listen to the patients what they're saying because that in itself i will tell you nowadays you have so much of a social media check and balance if you will by the patients that if anything goes south you automatically will say well there's something going on and i say this to you and to the many other ladies talk to your plastic surgeon directly do not talk to the nurse practitioner the pa or the office manager no they do not know they're not operating they're not going to be the ones who are going to be making the decision that the capsule is going to be removed off of the chest you need to talk to the surgeon directly and if you cannot get uh, a word and a uh, time with the surgeon i will tell you you are not uh with confidence going to be getting the right surgery the other thing i find which is very important your surgeon whatever discussion there is it should be very open and transparent 
where some surgeons say, well, what happens in the clinic room cannot leave because we don't want a web page, you know, a critique. No, I tell my patients, please go ahead and talk about your experience because the next patient now knows better. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing your journey. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of ladies who are going to listen to this and they will make benefit of this so they can apply this. I can do only so many of these a year, but at least they will seek out the surgeon that they feel confident in or at least they will not go to a surgeon and then have to undergo what you went through. Now, the other thing I want to mention is, you know, I like how decisive you were. You decided to go through the GoFundMe page and you were able to network and you were able to get this support. I will tell you, there are a lot of ladies who have uh, basically uh, been there and who want to help. I have had patients uh, where, for example, when a patient comes in, it's supposed to be a certain size of an implant or ruptured, and it turned out not to be the case, and I needed to refund the money to the patient. She said, well, go ahead and pass it on to the next patient, and, uh, you know, we have get gladly done that. Um, and we want to help, but we cannot promise each and every say, a patient it is more like a luck than anything else. And I don't want to say this, I'm responsible, but what I want to say is if you talk on uh, and discuss us, uh, with be it family, friends, or GoFundMe, whatever it takes to get the right surgery. You're better off not getting the surgery and being miserable than to getting a surgery and still being miserable and then having to undergo another surgery yeah. because that is much worse. Now, the next thing I want to mention here is that the insurance will never, never cover, will never cover a case like this. They don't recognize. Now, in your case, you had breast cancer. You would think they would cover it definitively, but they say, who told you to remove the capsule? And even when they do reimburse, it's a fraction or a nominal amount, and it will never justify, uh, you know, the four hours on average that it takes. Now, remember, it is not only the surgeon's fees, it is the anesthesia, uh, you know, fee. Uh, now, that is paid separate to the anesthesia team member, but it's the, the chemicals, the machine, whatnot else. And then also the facility fee. Remember, you walk into the hospital in the U.S., pretty much this surgery is almost 30000 just if you pay the hospital rather than an outpatient surgery center. Um, and if, look, this is the time that we live in. You want to get braces, for example, on average, that's 3500 5500 which is pretty much the norm, you know. And so this surgery in itself, if you ask me, given the board-certified uh, and the certified nature of the facility, all the team members that come in are vetted, double vetted, triple vetted. They have experience season. I have, believe it or not, yesterday, uh, my team member, uh, I, who is my assist, took two hours to get back home. On average, it takes him an hour and 15 minutes. One, my nurse takes almost an hour and 15 minutes. She comes because I have asked her, uh, I certainly can get a nurse uh, contingent. No, I want to get the same, so I have the same. She knows exactly what I want and I what I don't want, how to talk to my patients, discharge instructions, so it's exactly down to the T. And I couldn't find a better team member than my nurse, Caitlin, than my assist, uh, you know, Flamore, my uh, surgical tech, and my anesthesia team members. And those uh, 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 patients will certainly only attest. So I just want to mention, if any surgeons says your my your insurance will cover the cost i say this a hundred percent your surgery will not be done right because a reimbursement of 600 800 1200 dollars will not justify a four-hour surgery with all the risks that are associated with it yes surgery yeah. did for me it was not four hours it was probably about an hour and it, i don't feel it was thorough it wasn't thorough and um then I had complications after because it was done so quickly. I had a hematoma bleed three hours later and had to go in for another wow, four wow. hours. So your surgeon for the, now you had what's interesting and unique about you, you had just the implant on the right side and your surgeon removed the implant. Now, what did your surgeon do for you in that one hour? Well, this is a big, this is, now, this is very important because this is what I find your case to be even more interesting and I have to say very disappointing too. Uh, if, and because I read between the lines we shared, we discussed your operative note. So please tell me what you knew what happened to you in that one hour when you had your Canadian uh, surgeon. Uh, now, she has a, all the credentials and training that you would expect out of a plastic surgeon. Uh, now, what was 
it that you were made aware of what happened post-op? Well, I went in, she removed the total implant. It was a total capsulectomy. Um, and it was written on the surgical report and it, the time was written down and what she did was written in great detail. And uh, I made sure and called her after and said, now you've removed 100%. And I said, was it a total capsulectomy? She says, yes, it was. I removed every single, and I even went back in to take a piece that, that was on the ribs. And she told me she went right back in and took that and removed it. I have nothing to worry about. It's all removed. And, and then was home for three hours. They send you home really quickly. You couldn't stay in the hospital. And then I went right back in and my chest was as big as a football and they did a hematoma emergency surgery. And that was a photo three hour surgery. So That's, that was even- so The second surgery was three hours to remove the hematoma. And I, and I woke up during that surgery and that was just a nightmare too. I won't even go into that one, but it was, they're just trying to push it down and stop the bleeding and I couldn't breathe. And I, I completely was alert for, for part of that surgery. It wow. was just a botched up job. And I wish if I could turn back the clock that I would have walked in the other direction when she was minimizing and not accepting breast implant illness. I should have just said, Shannon, this one's not on board with you. You should be going someone who is. And I was just so desperate during COVID to have it removed. I just thought, let's just do this. Right. And because you you were so sick, you cannot even function every day. It was critical. Even when your surgery was delayed till June, you said you were could not last that long. You know, what is interesting is I have had patients that called me and they said, you know, and again, these are the words of the patients. I want the next date. I will pay you extra if you can get me on tomorrow. And I said, please, we don't do that type of work. We don't expect, and I never have taken and never will take any extra to expedite. Uh, we are very fair and transparent. There are patients who are hurting so much when they find out that this is what it is. Like you were very certain that this is what was causing you. Now, what's interesting is what you mentioned is very real. And this is the disturbing part. Your plastic surgeon is board certified. Now, remember, you're in Canada. You don't have the freedom to quote, go from one surgeon doctor to another. You're relatively, in a sense, limited because of the socialized medicine and the system, the way it's run. Your surgeon wrote down, and I saw it with my own eyes, and just like you said, it is written down on documentation, which is a legal record, that she did a total capsulectomy and block fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I read that note. And I clearly, within that circle, and I said, this is one sentence is negating. She sat down, she did an end block, then she went back and removed some of the capsule off of the rib. And all of a sudden, I could tell she does not know what the word end block means. She does not know what a total capsulectomy means because now I will tell you, when you are certified, when you are practicing as a plastic surgeon, you know, you have you've gone through so many tests, you know what is a capsule, you follow what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying anything other than the fact that you did not get a total capsulectomy because when I did your surgery for the residual capsules, the entire capsule was pretty much there. And you have the video to show you yeah. uh, and then to clearly show that the inflammation, the capsule was entirely present and that there, the, the capsule was very much adherent to the rib, which was very hard, uh, meaning the hardest part of the whole case. And when I went in, there was, quote, scar tissue from that one-hour surgery, not so much, but that three-hour hematoma where you have a sequela as a result of the three-hour uh, intervention, surgical intervention that she did in order to stop the bleeding. And this is where, you know, the surgery has to be done right. And I say this to you very humbly, as a board certified plastic surgeon who's explanting and has done almost a thousand explants, it is very hard to do a capsulectomy off of the rib and not everyone can do it. Number one, you have to have, quote, I use the word, the guts, the confidence, and that will from within the heart Look, she's telling you already on the initial consultation, you can get a pneumothorax. So she's already, I use the word, and I say this, I want people to critique me, but this is the point. Don't say it was done when in reality it was not. And that in itself is a problem in itself. Yeah. And just come out and say, you know, I've heard some surgeons tell their patients, I'm sorry, I did the best, but the capsule is remaining behind. 
I honor and admire that integrity of that plastic surgeon because he at least gave it the fair shot and he was honest about it. And you have to be very professional. We have heard this time and time again from the many other surgeons who go in and say, well, I had good faith. I wanted to remove the capsule, but because the capsule was so thin, I left it behind or I removed part of the capsule. I removed 70% because the other 30% on top of the rib was relatively hard. No, you have to go in. The surgeon has to go in, has to be committed, determined in order to removing the whole capsule because if that's not done, you're living through the same misery you did post-op from 2020 onwards when you had your explant. Now tell me, so you go talk to your surgeon post-op. You had this hematoma that is taken care of, and you ask your surgeon, she tells you, and you have the documentation that states you have had a total capsulectomy. Now tell me what happens next. Well, I went in and talked to her and um, made sure that she removed everything, and I mentioned to her that uh, I woke up during the hematoma bleed, and I... And she says, that's impossible. You were asleep for the whole thing. And I said, no, I wasn't. I actually woke up and I can tell you exactly what happened. And I reiterated what happened. And she looked at me like she had seen a ghost. Like she knew that I was actually awake for part of that surgery. I, I felt their hands on my chest pushing down. I couldn't breathe. And, and she just never admitted it. But I, I was and I, I knew exactly what went on. But I just went in there and told her um you know oh, this is this is what i hope that this has been done and after i left i came home and i felt as sick as i ever was before it, it none of my symptoms lifted and i thought she couldn't have done this there's no way she could have done this total removal of there must be some um pieces left and I had the rash, my hair was falling out. I was, it just stirred everything up. And so all I was still, those symptoms persisted. Yeah. And I knew she was not being honest with me. And I just said to, to my husband, I said, I'm going to keep going with this. I have to find someone who's going to do it properly. I thought, man, I do not want to have to go through, like I went through lumpectomy, mastectomy, implant, explant hematoma and i feel like some days i should have a zipper put in there because of the times that they've gone in my chest and done so much but i i thought i'm gonna have to do another surgery i don't want to but i'm damned if i'm gonna live like this i want quality of life i want to have my body i want to be able to walk upright i walk like a an old lady well no not old ladies not all of them walk like that but i was hunched over and I, I couldn't walk upright. I was as brain fog as they come. I, I would repeat things. I'd come in the room. I'd say something. My family would look at me. And I'd say the same thing again five minutes later. And they'd just say, you just told us that. And I said, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. And I was just out to lunch. And I knew there was something deeply wrong still. Wow. So. so you knew in your heart these were the residual capsules? Well, I knew that there was something left inside me yeah mm -hmm. right because you knew that the capsules were removed so what was the problem right okay now now what happened next so this was 2020 and then thereafter then what did you do well then i did the researching that i always do to try and get this thing solved and i found you and your testimonials of people and i just decided that's it i'm going to I'm going to focus on getting to Michigan. And um, it took me months to, you know, get the funds and to put all my ducks in a row, but I, I got there and, and I'm so glad that I found you because um, I just, I wish I would have skipped the other surgeon and just found you during COVID and made arrangements to come after COVID and directly to you. But, but I went the long route and the wrong route and uh i'm just that i'm just so grateful for sure now, yeah now the question is uh you had your surgery in february of this year so just a couple of months ago yeah. now let me ask you this uh how do you feel now today in april of 2023 a couple of months after your uh surgery how do you feel as far as your symptoms my head is clearer my brain fog is sometimes there but it's it's a lot clearer 
and my eyes aren't like I have a before and after shot and I my eyes were like slits I could hardly open them I have white back in my eyes my face isn't as red and blotchy my hair is not falling out my rash has disappeared um, my peripheral neuropathy is still there it's um, my feet and hands still hurt and I'm working with a naturopath right now to uh, lessen the load. I have a lot of heavy metals. I took a hair analysis and I have a lot of heavy metals in my body from the implant. So I'm, t I'm on something for that and hopefully it will lift for my um, peripheral neuropathy and I'll be able to walk better, I'm hoping. Just not sure when, but I can walk upright and my hips and my um, legs, my joints, they don't hurt as much. Like they, they, I can walk with more ease. And How much improved are you overall compared to, let's say, on, in February and now? Like 50%, 70%, 80%, 90 How much improved are you? I would say um, probably 60, 70%. Okay. And the other, uh, the hands and feet are my biggest thing for getting around. I, I, um, I walk the dog and um, my feet just are very sore and I think a lot of the toxins just have to come out of my body. Sure, so, uh, yeah. yeah, and I wanna go ahead and mention that it takes up to one year, again, maybe a little bit longer. It's your, literally, I will tell you in the grand scheme of things, hours out from your surgery, you know? Um, and uh, so you still have the 10 months or so before I would say, okay, let's go ahead and back and assess and where you are right now. Um, now, let me ask you this. I hope your surgeon is listening to this because, you know, uh, you know, I say this to the surgeons. Again, if you ask me to do a nose, I will be the first person to say not a good idea. Go to this doc. He's the king of rhinoplasty. If you ask me, uh, basically go ahead and do a cleft lip palate. I say I'm not trained in it, you know, even though I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. I say this to the many other surgeons, the whole gist, and this is the take home message, the whole gist of the surgery is to remove not only the implant, which anyone can remove, but the capsule sincerely, definitively. And this is a surgery where no matter what, it has to be removed. There is no like, well, I'm just gonna cauterize and get out. No, this has to be done completely, definitively from the good heart because the surgeon needs to realize that post-op, your good health, your bounce back is completely dependent on me or the surgeon to doing the complete job. And you cannot compromise the quality of the recovery by doing an incomplete job because you are yourself not trained. And this is a surgery, I will tell you, not everyone can do. If you ask me to remove an implant capsule from a chest, it's relatively easier than to remove a residual capsule, such as in your case, especially when there's sequela of a hematoma, scar tissue, amongst other inflammation that was present as a direct result of the previous surgical intervention, right? Remember, she's telling in her note that she went on the fourth rib and tried to remove the capsule, right? So she's already caused some, quote, breakage in the capsule. And the point I'm trying to make here is, your surgeon should have a track record of removing residual capsules because that is a lot harder than removing implant capsules in themselves, especially in those patients that have a rupture of the implant and there is a lot of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very important. And this is the take home message. You have to have that confidence, that firm belief that your surgeon believes in BII, that he has a track record of patients where you, they have benefited from complete removal and your surgeon vocally talks. And I'll tell you that what seals the deal here is that your surgeon is not putting in implants because if your surgeon is putting in implants, he or she will not believe in implants, i.e. as breast implant illness, and he will continue and she will continue to just basically you know, I have friends of mine that tell me, sure, if I have to say I believe in breast implant illness, it's in only a small fraction. And if I can get a few more patients, why not? That is wrong. Yeah. You have to believe in it from your heart completely, definitively. And like I've said before, you cannot say that the earth is round and flat at the same time. You have to accept one. And in this case, the earth is indeed round and the breast implants are absolutely bad, horrible, be it saline or silicone. And this is where the surgery needs to be done. 
and your surgeon cannot write 100% total capsulectomy because that is wrong falsified documentation if you ask me because we all know what is a capsule we have been trained according to the medical literature plastic surgery literature if there is a suspicious capsule the, and there is concern for bia alcl which is breast implant associated anaplastic larsa lymphoma the surgeon is required to removing the whole capsule that is directly around the implant. So the surgeons know what is a capsule because we're trained in this. Anytime there is a foreign body, i.e. a pacemaker or a lab port or screws that are put in in any part of, like say the skull, we, you know, we do reconstruction of the head, for example, a scar tissue forms around the foreign body, be it titanium, stainless steel in this case, uh, the implant, the silicon implant itself. And so we know, so the capsule was not removed. It was indeed absolutely not a total capsulectomy. It cannot be done in an hour. And I will say this to you, that what happened to you was disservice and wrong. And I will say very unprofessional. And I want people to call me out if I do something because I want to learn if I make a mistake. If I make a mistake, I come and I tell my patients because we're not human either, right? Yep. We're, I'm as human as you, right? Yep. And I can make mistakes, but in this case, this is where, remember, the whole basis of the explant surgery is that whole capsule must be sincerely removed, and not only the capsule, but the inflamed tissue around, along with the implant, in the end block fashion. And end block means that there is no break in the capsule and that all the internal contents are removed as one piece. 100% total capsulectomy can also be done, which is also very, 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 like, good and which is the desired goal of the surgery but if there is a small break in that capsule then that end block term doesn't apply what applies now is a hundred percent total capsulectomy so another way to look at it all end blocks are a hundred percent total capsulectomy but all a hundred percent total capsulectomies are not end blocks and a partial capsulectomy is absolutely not the standard of care it is wrong and bad medicine, that capsule must be removed completely. And when it's removed, it needs to be tested. Now, what's interesting is, so we have you, 60% improved, you said, and most importantly, you. That's what we want to hear. We have the pathology specimen that says that the capsule has in it chronic inflammation and what are the uh, manifestations of what is the silicon from within the capsule uh, that has uh, embedded in the silicon and that is the uh, the capsule that harbors all the badness. Uh, remember, you already had the explant done in 2020. All what was done was the residual capsule. And when I removed your tissue, there was another soft tissue mass that I removed that was sent separate. And that also said that there was uh, uh silica slash histiocytes chronic inflammation present in it and so that mass needed to be removed as much as the other capsule because had that not been removed you would not have had the bounce back that you're having and when i got done i will tell you this and i say this very openly and very vocally if I'm ever sitting on the fence, should I remove some more tissue, even at the expense of the aesthetics, I remove it. I don't care about the aesthetics because I don't want the tissue to look good and the next thing you know, the patient is hurting. So I go out of my way above and beyond to removing because I cannot tell, I can tell grossly that looks abnormal and has a different consistency or a color or a feel and that's why I need to remove it. I can tell the good, Fat, for example, from the dusky, dark, irregular, uh, bad looking fat. And as you can see that I removed that tissue. And when you look at those videos and pictures that I sent you, you can see all good, viable, healthy tissue remaining behind with all bad tissue removed. And I clearly show the capsule and I pick it up with my pickups and I show exactly what was indeed left behind. And the total capsulectomy was absolutely not done. Yeah. Yes, and I'm really glad you removed everything. And I don't really care how I look. I just want my health back. I mean, it's just so nice to be going better every day. And um, I'm just very afraid for people who, um, like another uh, patient that might see that surgeon and expect to have a total capsulectomy and removal i'm just afraid for you know that they're not trained properly and i i just i don't want them to go through 
something like that to have to seek out another surgeon again they do train them to remove them completely then i guess so i will tell you, you know this is required this is you know any plastic surgeon let's say uh, who is putting in implants and they find that the capsule looks suspicious or abnormal thick or has basically fluid around it is required this is part of our training you don't get board certified as a plastic surgeon this is required these are the questions they ask us on our board exam by the way what is the treatment the treatment of choice if this is not done it's malpractice so the treatment of choice is to send the capsule off you can do a frozen and sometimes the frozen section may not be just conclusive but that capsule must be removed in its entirety because if you leave that behind you leave the lymphoma behind and we are all taught this breast implants now in your case you had textured their band now remember you use the word recall now what's interesting is france banned the textured implants and then the U.S. soon thereafter kind of followed France and said, hey, you know what, we're going to now it would have been better if the U.S. stepped up and said we're going to do that first become become the leader. Right now, this is a fact. And I'm not trying to scare people. You can see the wordings of the FDA. Textured implants by far are notorious, very classically associated. But silicon smooth implants, the non textured ones are also associated. And saline implants are also associated with lymphoma and squamous cell, but to a lesser extent. How much, I do not know, FDA doesn't know, and the literature, medical literature. So those numbers, fact, are underreported cases of BILCL and squamous cell. That's why the FDA put out the warning. And they say, if you're suspicious, you have to get it checked. What's unfortunate is most of the plastic surgeons do not send the capsule off to pathology if you're not going to send it off you're not going to know what is the capsule made of you cannot diagnose cancer by looking at a specimen with the naked eye and saying well this looks cancerous this is the, the pathologist has to look at it has to do the cd30 stain has to look at the other cells and then reach a decision with conclusion that this is indeed lymphoma. And then guess what? Once you get the diagnosis, you have to be treated. The treatment is very aggressive. You have to see a medical oncologist um, and you have to uh, sometimes see a surgical oncologist for any lymph nodes, but a medical oncologist chemotherapy and some of these patients undergo chemotherapy for months and many cycles I do not know how to treat BILCL because I am a plastic surgeon, but this is the specialty of the medical oncologist at a major cancer center like Carmanos Cancer Center in the state of Michigan, the number one cancer center, or University of Michigan or Royal Oak. I wouldn't go anywhere else. Uh, you, uh, you're looking at major hospitals like the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, the specialty mega centers that are well versed with the right cancer centers into treating BILCL like MD Anderson, for example. I wouldn't go anywhere to a small community hospital. Remember, at a community hospital, if I go 50 miles away from any major city of the U.S., and this is well established, the quality of care goes down significantly, you're not going to get the treatment that you would at a major medical center, and this is very well established. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So now uh, what I'm going to do is uh, now let me ask you a couple of questions. What would you say to those doctors, internal medicine, primary care doctors, that doctor who told you the COPD, that doctor who told you, what would you tell your doctors? Well, I guess I can't fault them, but um, I would tell them to get more well versed. Uh, with breast implants and the fact that mine was recalled and I mentioned that to several specialists and they kind of just let it filter out of their mind and tried to make their own diagnosis and I just wish that more specialists and doctors would get on board with the See one thing I want to jump in and say if you ask me uh, how much do I know about COPD? I'm going to use the word zero. I know what it is. I know how to, you know, what are the treatments I can read a book and say, but have I treated anyone with COPD? Zero. With a arrhythmia? Zero. Am I a pediatrician? Zero. And I use the word, now I can figure it out, but I'm not going to ever treat a kid, for example, right? Meaning I'm not a pediatrician. They have their own physiology, right? 
Now, I'm an MD, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm a board certified general surgeon. When I use the word zero, I'm not going to take the risk and shoot in the dark and try to treat. Likewise, I wouldn't expect a cardiologist to comment on breast implant illness, right? So I say to them, and remember, these are the gateway physicians. Any problems, you go straight to them. They're the ones they say, let's see what we can do. If not, then, okay, now I'm going to send you to the specialist. Then the specialist is like, oh, it cannot be the implants because they do not know much, just like I do not know how to treat leukemia, right? Uh, you know, and I don't think I ever will know because I'm not interested in knowing, meaning it's, it's a three-year commitment after internal medicine, right? So the point I'm trying to make is now this is where the medical community, the plastic surgery community, and not through the FDA, but we need to educate these emergency room doctors and the primary care doctors that, listen, BII indeed does exist. I have my patients, my nurses, my uh, they're educating the internal medicine now. It goes in from one year out the other because you cannot give like a two minute lecture or 20 minute lecture or go on and listen to someone's testimony, right? But this is real. Now look, the masses are talking about, now you have celebrities that are coming forth now that is truly making the system change for the better. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what would you say to the many plastic surgeons who are listening, for example, to this conversation and they say, well, this is all in your head. This is your nice naturopath doctor who's doing the wonders on you. I would just say that's fine. I'm, I'm sure that you're thinking that, but I know my body and I know my gut feeling on things and um, I was not imagining it. I was told that, you know, maybe they just kind of look at me when I've been there a couple times and shook their head. I know they were shaking their head, but they weren't, but it was, it just felt like I wasn't being, this wasn't being recognized and it was kind of being minimized. And I even went to emergency for 12 hours because I couldn't walk, my legs were swollen, my rashes were going, and, and the person gave me some compression stockings and said, you need to go and, and wear these. And I, I thought, really? I was just here for 12 hours? And it, it just, it's just a big, um, I just feel that they could have been more on board with me and and really heard some of the things that I said and I did mention implants several times and it never sparked them to think that this could possibly be an implant and yeah I would I would just tell them to try and open their minds a bit more to these sure things. sure you know now this is again you know it is these type of testimonies hopefully the more we write about it i.e you and the plastic surgeons who are explanting uh, that basically this is, and again, the system, the, the social media in itself is picking up the many ladies. Look, I say to everyone, don't listen to me, listen to the FDA. The FDA has said three things. Number one, breast implants are not lifetime devices. This is FDA's words. And I want anyone who wants to fact check me, absolutely do so. FDA has said that breast implants are not lifelong devices, 10 to 15 years. I say seven to 10. Look, two days ago, I operated on a lady. She had implants just two years. A 32 year old lady, she had implants and she realized what you realized that it's the implants, get them out. Uh, she went, she had a positive HLA B27. I did a Facebook live directly from the operating room. So the FDA says the implants are not meant to be in the body forever, 10 to 15 years, they last if you ask me sometimes as early as uh, the first day, like in your uh, case, number two, the FDA said they're associated with breast implant associated anaplastic Larsen lymphoma. And they also said squamous cell cancer. They also said that bre I, I, breast implant illness, the brain fog, fatigue, the joint problems, all these symptoms that you mentioned, they do exist and that there is, quote, complete resolution, close quotes, when these implants are removed definitively without replacement. If you look at the manufacturers, they say you need to get an MRI at year three and then every two years they're onward. This is Mentor, Allergan, and even the FDA attesting to the fact only 5% of the patients get an MRI in this fashion. We know the many uh, detrimental effects such as 
the rupture rate at six years, 10 years, and then how it goes up significantly, the malpositioning, the fatigue, uh, the, the, the contracture, infection, uh, look, problems like hematoma, amongst others, can occur while uh, putting an implants, the nerve sensation loss. And then you have the many, many symptoms. And lastly, if you listen to just the ladies and the masses, just go in any of these Facebook posts, you will see the many patients who have explanted when explanted right, the resolution of their many symptoms and the joint pain. And it is imperative. This purpose of this talk today is the capsule needs to go as much as it needs the implant needs to go and all the tissue around it must be checked this is what i say the what needs to be done and this is how i do it number one this is not the time to be doing a lift this is the time uh not to be uh basically putting in the drains i don't do that uh, you did not need drains number three uh twilight sedation look not a single patient to date has woken up or said i heard uh, you know uh, in the operating room number four the implants in your case this does not apply but the implants are always returned to the patient number four number five uh the I take the picture video high definition to show that complete removal of the capsule was indeed done. What I offer to the young 22 year old, I offer to all the patients and I send cultures for aerobic and orbic and fungal. I send the capsules off to pathology. So complete detailed, comprehensive analysis. And I have a bond with each and every single patient. This is what you and all the patients need to strive for, that you feel that confidence that your surgeon is gonna do the right surgery so that post-op, you have no doubt in your mind. You're not worrying about if it was left behind or not. Because remember, if I did not believe in any of this, right? Trust me, I'm better off financially, three times as financially putting in implants than taking them out. And it's a lot harder surgery than putting them in. Putting them in takes just one hour. Removing them on average takes me four hours uh, for bilateral breast implant plus capsule removal. Yeah. Now, what I, yeah. now what I want you to do, please, uh, Shannon, if you can please, whatever you want to say, a closing statement, whatever is on your mind, please, you're a very strong-willed lady. I admire that. I, look, you overrode a lot of doctors. You knew in your heart. Remember, your sixth sense does not lie. Tell us, tell us what the other patients want to and should listen to. I would say be an advocate for your health. Um, when I developed cancer, I had two mammograms, two ultrasounds. They sent me home, said I was cancer free. And I wondered then what is this lump? And yeah. I kept, and I said, and I was polite and persistent. And I pushed and I, the secretary was sick of me by the end of the week. I said, I want to have a biopsy of this lump. She says, you're fine. You don't have cancer. And I said, I want a biopsy, please. And I called her every day until she finally gave in and said, okay, we'll give you a biopsy. And then with that biopsy, they said, um, this is very alarming news. You, you do have cancer. And if I wouldn't have pushed back oh. then for my cancer, um, and, and diagnosis of the lump, and I would have listened to her and just put my tail between my legs and walked, I wouldn't be here for my kids and my husband right now. And um, I, I just want to say to advocate when you feel something's not right, um, when you feel it's, um, you have a gut sense, just push very politely because if you're not polite they don't listen to you but if you're polite and persistent they get so sick of you and they have to do something mm -hmm. that's that's what i would say and um just to be try and be positive and know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel with cancer with implant illness there is a light and um you just get through it and it's it's nasty but you have to get through it and get support from people. If you have a supportive family, my family was so supportive. They just went through so much with me and I, I want to thank them for that and supportive friends. And if somebody poo poos you and says, Oh, you know, they minimize it, then go find another friend. Cause, cause you need to have support through all of it as well. Brother, this and is very important to the support is very much key because you don't want to be alone. I have had some ladies, uh, that are alone going through this. No, I tell them you have uh, the whole uh, network of ladies on my Facebook page and other Facebook pages. You know, they're all 
uh, the, the, you know, we all, you know, they're basically so, and it's amazing to see this big family together and you have, you ha have someone in another part of the U.S. and you will connect with them like they're the best friends and they continue to be friends. You know, that's the amazing beauty of the whole thing and write and talk about it. And what you said, listen to them, listen to their journey. It makes your post-op course better. Yeah. And just remember to advocate and don't, don't back down if you know something's not right. And I had a question for you. Um, back in the day when I had my implant put in, in 2010, there was nothing that I had to sign or no warnings that they gave me before I had it done. They deemed it very safe. They said, oh, it's a routine surgery. You know, there's nothing that you have to worry about. Um, these things are for life. And I just, I wish they would have had some kind of a thing to read or a warning. I would have probably read it and I, I wish I could turn back the clock, but I know I can't, but um, I just wondered about that. So I will tell you, so in today, um, in April of 23, and this is as of last year as well, the FDA, this is the FDA, they have mandated that the Plastic surgeons need to sit down and discuss with them these three things. The implants are not meant to be in the body forever, lymphoma, and that BII does exist. And if there's a problem, you need to get this black box warning, right? This is where the surgeon needs to have the patient initial. And unfortunately, this never happens. If my best friend were to get breast cancer today, I will tell you with 90.9.99% confidence, she is going to get implants as if they are the safest and the best thing on earth unfortunately and this all these warnings and the red flags they are unfortunately not even discussed and this is a major problem where the informed consent is not given by the patient what they're signing up for and this is what i want the young college students who are interested in getting implants or the cancer patients to please do your homework and you will only reach a decision and a conclusion breast implants are bad devices they are not safe Yes, you may have a transient coat period where you may take benefit of them, but ultimately you will only be a, pay a big price, but be it lymphoma, very small chance, but again, it does exist. We do not know what the numbers and all the other associated complications. Remember the rupture rate goes up uh, after the 10 year studies, at least that they have done. There's no 20 year studies because you will be shocked to see how many implants rupture 15 year studies. I dare anyone to find those studies because they don't exist. And the point here is we, this is kind of like a factory. Someone hears the word cancer, all of a sudden, after that, they don't hear anything else. And I know this because I talked to the patients. They have a family member, basically they give or translate the information to them the patients are usually numb they don't comprehend now they may go to these support groups or they may talk to a nurse practitioner but they truly think while well, you're at the breast center there's the diagnosis next the plastic surgeon is going to come talk to you the next then you go to the if you need chemotherapy there's a medical oncologist is there or oh, next room down is an imaging person next room down that's your exit and we'll see you you know monday morning at 7 30 for your surgery and unfortunately the sign here sign here and i will tell you this is what happens in the vast majority of the cases unfortunately and i'm not making this up because i have been at a breast center and i know how things work and any of the nurses or any a uh, person who works at a breast center or the hospital, they know this is pretty much the norm. It's true, because when I had cancer, I wanted to sit with it for a couple of years before I thought about implanting, if I was going to do that. But when I was done my surgeries, uh, I was given a plastic surgeon and was told that they could uh, put an implant in and they could maybe make it bigger if I wanted you know they were so into even my good breast they said let's put a bigger one in there and and go for the gusto and then we'll put a bigger one in the breast that you lost and um, they wanted to up the ante and I, I said no if it ain't broke don't fix it I don't want you touching my good one I want you to maybe put a smaller one in they said well i don't know if we can find one that small and i thought well do what you can do and that's after i dropped it on the grocery store floor and that that's when i decided to get an implant but i just 
they really wanted you to to um they upselled you and wanted you to keep going with it and i thought this is you know i'm not into i just want to be healthy and if if i could tell all the ladies and men out there men get implants to um just be happy with what god gave you um there's nothing wrong with the breasts that you have um and also if you have cancer and lose it completely and you're as flat as a pancake deal with it i'm sorry but i would never ever if i tell you to run the other direction i wish i would have stayed flat and just got a uh, prosthesis mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. don't even no i just i just want to emphasize here you know as a general surgeon like having done trauma surgery i've dealt with patients with necrotizing fasciitis, which is you have the flesh eating bacteria where you, in order to save the body, you cut the leg off, for example, or the arm. And the patients are gladly accepting because they know that once it's necrotic, that limb is not coming back. Unfortunately, there are diseases like that. And the point I'm trying to make here is we should do whatever it takes, but not harm the body. Do no harm. That's the whole. Uh, and in this case, we know we are harming the body. And that's the take home message. You were, uh, you lived through a misery of 10 years and then after explanted and another misery of uh, two years and two months, uh, you know, from the time you explanted, having uh, undergone uh, the complete residual capsule, despite what you were told you had, which was uh, certainly not correct. Now, I just want to go ahead and take this time. I'm going to answer a couple of questions. Uh, by uh, Kea, is there any benefit in terms of capsulectomy if the implant is placed over or under the muscle? Over the muscle is relatively easy because I'm not dissecting on top of the rib. The pectoralis major is what is on top of which the implant is sitting. And so that capsule is directly on top of the muscle. So it's relatively easier dissection because I'm not dissecting off of the rib. Remember, dissecting off of the rib is the hardest part. So my best case scenario is a lady with a small implant directly on top of the pectoralis above the muscle because I don't have to dissect on top of the rib and I'll take that any time of the day. Next question that I'm seeing here is, I have been battling skin cancer off and on, squamous cell cancer. Now I'll tell you, the squamous cell cancer inside is very different than the squamous cell cancer on top. Uh, and that is more like from the sun and then the, 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 the low pigmentation on the skin, the fair skin that allows for, quote, the burn. Um, sometimes some patients are predisposed to squamous cell, but there is no true direct correlation between the squamous cell cancer within from the sun. No, the squamous cell cancer was a direct result, just like the BILCL, BILCL as a direct result of the implants. And I was very much surprised when I heard the squamous cell cancer from the implants around or in the capsule that is very very uh, interesting now in the burn world for example if someone has a burn for example to the hand and it's a burn that's many years old chronic inflammation will result in squamous cell cancer on a burn that actually has a term margarine ulcer that results in a old burn because of the chronic inflammation and you can imagine the chronic inflammation that gives rise to the squamous cell and that is by and by from my experience, what would be if you put the two and two together? Now, again, I was very much surprised squamous cell cancer as a direct relationship to the breast implants. Uh, so now, uh, um, what I'm going to do here is uh, Shannon. Um, I see there are a lot of nice comments. Um, how do you know if it is under or over the muscle? Good question. So, so number one, you can get the operative record and the surgeon will say, I made a pocket underneath the pectoralis muscle and put in the implant. So you, you surgeon will tell you. The second thing is you can get an imaging and MRI. Sometimes a mammogram will tell you these are prepectoral or submuscular, right? So the mammogram, you cannot, I as a plastic surgeon cannot tell because sometimes the implant was placed below and it just migrates down and i asked um, you know one of and i cannot tell by exam now sometimes you can get a good idea but i cannot be 100 percent certain because the implant sometimes the 
pectoralis muscle, this atrophy or thin out or the implant breaks through, and then you uh, basically uh, will not be able to tell convincingly if this was above or below. Um, and the only other time that I find out is uh, when the implant, when I'm dissecting, I find out if it is above or below when I dissect. Now, this is very important. And those many patients, for example, that have two, three, four sets of implants, which is not uncommon for me to find out, I want to make sure maybe the first two implants were above the muscle and the second two were below. So I have to remove those residual capsules from the first two sets, right? That is as important as removing the capsules from the second two sets that were below. So that is very important. And this is where I myself do the questioning with the patients in clinic and I basically be the devil's advocate. And I say, well, if you had two and I don't have an operative record, you cannot d conclude this from MRI. Then I always say, I'm gonna check above the muscle to visualize that there is no capsule. And I'm gonna obviously remove the implant and capsule below. That way you don't want to be potentially leaving that residual capsule from the first set of implants behind. And again, it is as important as removing the second set. No, thank you so much, uh, Shannon. It was a wonderful discussion. You talked about what are the essentials, the gist of explant surgery. The capsule must absolutely be removed. Otherwise, you're not going to bounce back. These are your words. Uh, this is a uh, uh, take-home message for the ladies. Please share this with the other face group, uh, groups. There are millions of ladies. They say there are 35 million ladies with implants all over the world. Uh, and there are so many who are hurting. I'm humbled to say that I'm actually going to be presenting my data at the World Congress of Plastic Surgeons in Dubai uh, next uh, month in May, where my thousand explants, I'm going to go ahead and discuss with almost 1,200 plastic surgeons who are going to be there. So I'm looking forward to discussing uh, my experience that I discussed and outlined earlier where hopefully I will be able to voice my experience with explantation that it absolutely can be done. It is certainly challenging and why how I do it in the manner that I do. I'm humbled that the Plastic Surgery International Society, where all the plastic surgeons from, believe it or not, 192, that's what they say, uh, the, uh, 112, excuse me, 112 countries Plastic surgeons from 112 countries are going to converge, and there's going to be 1,200 of us that I will have a chance to present my data. And, you know, I want people to critique me, talk about it, and I will end with this. I will tell them all what I'm doing is removing the implant, and I'm removing the capsule, and I'm making sure it's no BIALCL, no squamous cell cancer, and that your story and the stories of the many other ladies which are real will only attest to the fact that the capsule and all that residual bad inflamed tissue must be removed. Otherwise, you're going to have patients who are going to continue to hurt and suffer. And then only when the residual capsulectomy is done, only then will they bounce back. And you are a live attestation to this fact. I appreciate you discussing. And hopefully, one day, implants will be banned. And hopefully, we will discuss the best and optimal way of removing. And I cannot imagine anyone doing any differently than I uh, am doing uh, without hurting and only doing what is necessary and not doing the unnecessary drains, not doing the unnecessary lifts and where the patients are actually very happy. And those words that you mentioned, enjoy your body that that the body that God gave you as I get older, you look, I got platysmal banding on my neck. I need plastic surgeon to fix this. No, I'm happy with what I am and I don't need to get any plastic surgery. I'm happy uh, the way I am and I enjoy, uh, enjoy what your wise words were and embrace who I am. And even if I get all the wrinkles in the world, I'm never going to get Botox no. and I'm never going to get a facelift or a neck lift. And I'm going to stay away as far as I can from the plastic surgeon. And I say this humbly from a board certified plastic surgeon. I think we have to all work on our insides and getting self-esteem to feel good about ourselves in that way. And not always go on social media and see, oh, so-and-so looks this way or so-and-so does this. And just be happy with yourself and get confident and know that you present yourself in the way you present yourself. And if people don't like you, too bad, you know? <laughs> you know, I will tell you, I admire you so much, you know, your personality, how 
you know, even, you know, like the, the, you know, the way you said it so assertively and you were very candid about how it all started. And, you know, I will tell you, I learned so much about your journey. Obviously, we didn't talk about the details in the manner when you first came to me. I remember when I first saw you, obviously, we had had a lengthy discussion on the phone, but it's always nice to see, uh, you know, your personality come out in this uh, hour or so long, uh, you know, discussion. Well, thank you so much. God bless you for coming on. And I appreciate all your insight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No, no, anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care, Shannon.